All right, this is the first screencast of three short videos to replace class on Friday, October 4th. Reminders, exam number four is a week from Friday, October 11th, and this will include material that we cover on Wednesday, which will be new. So if you haven't started kind of thinking about studying, looking at the study guide, this would be a good time to do that uh, over the weekend or the beginning of next week. You don't want to put this all off to the last minute. Our last topic is the flowering plants, and they're really weird, so there's going to be some new stuff to think about there. You don't want to have a backlog of new stuff to think about. We will spend a lot of time in lab looking at the flowering plants, the angiosperms, so you will have a lot of time to practice with these things, but not a whole lot of space between Wednesday and the exam on Friday. In class on Wednesday, we talked about one group of vascular seedless plants, the division Lycopodiophyta, or the lycophytes. And depending on what section you're in, we got introduced to the ferns uh, to a different degree. So we're going to start um, with what the section second section got to, which was a little bit less. So we're going to just start right off with the beginning of ferns and their cousins, the fern allies. A second video will review the vascular seedless plants, and then a third video will be a short introduction to the seed plants to introduce you to some of these really new features that we're going to see in those organisms. Okay, one of the labs, one of the section, lecture sections got here, the other one didn't. Here's a review if you've already seen this. So, so far, we've seen three different kinds of structures that we might call leaves. And what I want you to know about these is that they are three different structures from three different evolutionary origins. Um, okay, so here they are. Here's the list. We have the quote-unquote leaves that we saw on the gametophytes of nonvascular plants like our mosses. We have the microfills that we saw in the lycophytes, these leaves with a single vascular bundle, a single vein running through their leaves. So these leaves can be bigger than what we see in the non-vascular plants, but still relatively small because once you get away tissue-wise in this tissue, once you get away from this vein, what's moving materials through this tissue is osmosis and diffusion, which is reasonably efficient, but not really on the scale, efficient enough on the scale of a whole organism. So we've got the microfills, a separate tissue, a separate developmental origin from what we saw in the gametophytes of our non-vascular plants. The third kind of leaf, which has been foreshadowed, you saw this in lab on the ferns, are the megafills. Um, reminder, the suffix fill refers to a leaf uh, so we've got micro and mega fills. And these are leaves that actually evolved not from microfills, but from branch systems. And I'm going to tell you what that looks like on the next slide. And these are the leaves that we see in the seed plants, so the angiosperms and the gymnosperms, as well as the ferns and, and some of the fern allies like Equicetum, which you saw in lab. Okay, and so the megaphils, here's our cartoon. There is a central vein usually, and then veins branching off from that. So now we can have much larger leaves because of this more elaborate vascular system within this flat piece of tissue that we call a leaf. So three different types of tissues that we might call leaves, three different flat photosynthetic tissues three different evolutionary origins. These are analogous characters. Okay, just a comparison between the microfill and the megafill again, and we're going to talk about megafills, sometimes referred to as you fills, you meaning true, so true leaves. All right, so here is what I'm talking about regarding the branch system. 
So we've talked about an organism that looks like this. This looks like Coxonia. This looks like some of our modern lycophytes, a dichotomously branching organism. And if we think about this organism as having a set amount of resources that it can spend on growth, and we recall that this organism is living in an environment with uh, lots of competition for light, so densely packed individuals right at the surface of the soil, this individual would do better, it would get more sunlight if it could spend its resources to grow tall. So what happens, what would allow this organism to grow tall? Well, one of these branches would have to be dominant and the other one would have to get a little shorter. So here's a progression showing what that looks like. So over evolutionary time, this is not one individual at different points during its lifetime. This is uh, dif uh, different representations of an evolutionary process over hundreds of thousands of years. What we see is the evolution of a dominant branch. Here in C, it's really clear that there's one stem that is dominant over the others. This diagram isn't really depicting that the plant can now get taller, but we could uh, reason that it could if the side branches are shorter. So we've got one dominant stem and then these side branches. What would also be favored would be if these side branches, if the tissue sort of filled in, kind of like the webbing on a foot of an aquatic organism. All right, so we get the increased dominance of a single branch. So we get one dominant stem instead of multiple dominant stems, or I guess the lack of any dominant stem. So one dominant stem, the side branches reduce, and then they fill in with tissue around the vascular bundle. So these stems would have all had vascular tissue in them. They're reducing over time. They fill in to be this flat thing that we know of as a leaf now with a complex branching vascular system. Okay, so what the megaphyll is not an elaboration of the microfill. The megaphyll did not evolve from the microfill. The megaphyll evolved from a branch system. This is based on uh, developmental information, fossil information, um, a variety of, of pieces of data. And all of that data suggests that we have a single origin for all of the plants with megaphylls. And that means that they are a monophyletic group. And if we want to be really jargony, we can call them the euphilophytes, the true leaved plants. So we're talking about the ferns today. You've seen ferns before. We know that they are relatively small. They're forest understory plants, typically. A lot of variation in what the leaves look like. You saw fern allies in lab, fern allies being closely related to the ferns, but having some really different morphological characteristics. So polypodiophyta having the same derived character, two of the same derived character, well, herbaceous is not derived. Vascular plants is a derived character in the lycophytes. Our ferns are also vascular plants. They don't have wood and they have these megaphylls. Something new that we see with the ferns is the presence of a rhizome. So rye refers to something underneath the ground. Um, what this is, is a stem running underneath the ground. So what you think of when you think of a fern is actually just the leaves and the stem runs laterally under the ground. And we call that stem a rhizome. We think of compound leaves in our fern. Sometimes the leaves are simple, meaning they don't have uh, lots of dissection, lots of pieces in part. So ferns can look a little bit different. In, the equ in Equisetum, we have megaphylls, but they're sheathed around the stem. So still those leaves, but they definitely look a little bit different. A few highlights of reproduction in the ferns. You saw this in lab. On the underside of leaves, we have these clusters of sporangia, and each cluster is called a sorus, 
S-O-R-U-S, or multiple are called sori. Abaxial means underside. So we've got sori on the underside of leaves. If we zoom in on one of these sori, a sorus, you can see the individual sporangia. And then this cartoon is showing us just a single sporangium. It's got a stalk, which should be reminiscent of what we saw in the mosses, in the liverworts, also in the lycophytes. Okay, a stalk, and then this capsule that has spores inside. In the ferns, we've got a special adaptation to help fling the spores out into the world. So there's this weak part called an aperture, which is a general word for an opening. So we've got this weak spot that's going to open up and we've got this special tissue called an annulus. And you definitely saw this under the microscope. I heard a lot of people saying, oh, it kind of looks like a bug. It does kind of look like a bug. You've got this annulus. What happens with the annulus is that as the sporangium starts to dry out, this tissue around the top contracts and it actually pulls the sporangium open. So this kind of mohawk looking thing contracts, gets smaller, and that pulls this opening open even more. Then it's like a catapult. It's pulled back, the tension releases, and the whole lid kind of swings forward and flings the spores out into the world. Oh, I forgot to show you this first. So you saw a slide like this. Here's the inside of the leaf. Here are two vascular bundles inside the leaf, and here are our individual sporangia. In lab, ours didn't have this extra piece of tissue. Um, we're going to ignore it. Some sporangia, some sori have this special thing. You don't have to think about it. We've got our cluster of sporangia here in our sorus. Sori can be arranged in a variety of different ways, in lines, kind of in rows of dots, which is what you saw in lab. They can be over a whole part of the leaf, on just part of the leaf. They can actually have their own totally separate leaf. So the presence of sori, the uh, structure of the sporangium is consistent in all the ferns. Exactly how the sori are arranged is one characteristic that is species specific. Um, so here's a good picture of sori on special leaves. So this is a sensitive fern. It's got these tropophylls, these photosynthetic leaves, and then it's got these sporophylls, these special leaves that just have sori, they don't really do any photosynthesis. Here's a good picture of that sporangium broken open and it's flung the spore into the air. So just like in the lycophytes, we have dispersal of our progeny through spores. Yeah, sperm swim, but a sperm all by itself isn't useful. So sperm move around, but that's not really dispersal of an organism. It's just dispersal of a gamete. So how do we get our babies out into the world? By spores. The zygote is hooked into the gametophyte. It doesn't leave. You saw this on a slide. We might have the opportunity to see it in lab next week. So here's our gametophyte. Down here would have been an archegonium where the egg got fertilized and out grew our sporophyte. Here it is. And this is the root of the sporophyte. So initially the sporophyte is dependent on the gametophyte. Once the sporophyte gets its root, it doesn't need the gametophyte anymore. The gametophyte really just shrivels up and decomposes and the sporophyte goes on to live its ferny life. Here's a life cycle diagram with the ferns. So some of the specific things we talked about. We talked about the sori. They're on the mature sporophyte individual. We looked at the sporangium with a special structure called the annulus. I'm going to have to skip that because I'm almost out of time. All right, here's 20 seconds. Ferns vary in their ecology and in their size. We've got small aquatic ferns. We've got ferns that live in really dry places. We've got ferns that live in the forest understory. We've got ferns that live upon trees. We have ferns that are almost like trees. There's no wood here. This is just densely packed cells. So a variety of ways that ferns can be, but they all share these characteristics in common. 
All right, we're moving into the seed plants so and we're going to see some new interesting adaptations that I don't have time to read to you. I'll see you in the next couple of videos.